Today, we're going to be talking about NFTs, otherwise known as non-fungible tokens. We're going to be talking about what non-fungible tokens are, why some NFTs are worth $69 million and other NFTs are worth $1.50. We're going to be talking about why some people think they could be worthless and why others think they're just being used in the wrong way. So let's just jump into the topic because it's uh, quite exciting. If you're wondering what I'm doing on this video, I'm playing in a game called Decentraland. It's a game where you can actually show off your NFTs and use them to do things like maybe even fight monsters so let's get into what an nft is versus something that is not an nft or non-fungible versus fungible so non-fungible is something that's unique it would be something like the mona lisa because the mona lisa is one of one or for instance your childhood charizard card that is something that's unique that card is judged on that card's quality alone so if someone wants to value your charizard card they're going to look at that card look for scratches look for dents look for bends and everything like that the same could be said for a baseball card, a comic book, or a baseball that might have been signed by Brad Pitt. But if you've got something fungible, it's worth what it's worth, right? So something fungible would be something like a, a U.S. dollar. A U.S. dollar is a U.S. dollar. If I pull one out of my wallet and you pull one out of your wallet and we trade, they're sort of worth the same thing. And there's so many of them, it's sort of like they're interchangeable. Now, dollars or something that's fungible can become non-fungible. So if you put a story behind something and that story can be linked to that specific item, all of a sudden that item it's now non-fungible. If I have a dollar, right, I get Keanu Reeves to sign that dollar, then I get Brad Pitt to sign that dollar, and they get into a boxing ring right after they signed it, that dollar is now worth more than your dollar that you're pulling out of your wallet. It's been touched by greatness. I'm talking about Keanu Reeves, right? It's been touched by greatness. So it is worth something more. We can both agree that if we take either of those dollars to the candy store, we're gonna get the same thing, but if we sell them on auction, I'm probably gonna get a little bit more for the dollar that's been signed by a bunch of famous people. Now, that is how something that's fungible can become non-fungible. But the question is, can something non-fungible become fungible? Well, we don't really know. For instance, let's take the Charizard card example. If all of a sudden with Charizard cards, they said that there'd actually been a quarter million Charizard cards printed at the same time that were printed in the same decade that they've just been holding in storage and they release them all onto the market. Maybe those cards now become more fungible than non-fungible. You see, it's a state that can wane and ebb. The Mona Lisa is super fungible. It's got a story behind it. It's so old that it just is unique. You know that there is not going to be another Mona Lisa. No matter how many times I Photoshop the Mona Lisa, no matter how many posters I hang up on my wall, my poster is never going to be the same thing as the thing hanging up in the Louvre. The one in the Louvre's been touched by greatness. It has a story behind it. And I can tell that same story about a poster, but it is not the physical thing. And people hold value in having that physical thing. It's the same reason that if you build a piece of Ikea furniture, you're probably going to keep it longer than something that some dude just ships in and drops off at your house. That is fungible versus non-fungible. That thing actually has a value because it has a story and because it is a thing, because it's unique. Now, when it comes to tokens or it comes to NFTs, the idea behind these is that story can be attached to a specific address or a specific token. This address is unique and is something that can't be copied. Now, people are going to say, you know, what about counterfeiting? Well, here's a question for you. How easy would it be to counterfeit the Mona Lisa? So, First off, you've got to get the skills needed to counter for the Mona Lisa. You've got to become an artist. You've got to become a painter. You've got to get all this old stuff together and somehow figure out a way to beat all these tests. And then you've got to convince everybody that the Louvre actually doesn't have the Mona Lisa. But it's possible. With an NFT, it really isn't possible. You see, I can steal an NFT, right? I can rob you. I can take your phone, get you to unlock it, and now I've got your NFT. But what I can't do is copy it because that NFT was signed at a date and that date is verified by a blockchain. The blockchain is controlled by a bunch of people. It's controlled by everybody. It's a decentralized ledger. And the thing behind this is if I want to forge something, 
I need to get over 50% of that network in my control, or I'd need to figure out quantum computing. And if you could do either one of these, the CIA is going to be knocking on your door. They're going to be offering you half a billion dollars, and you're going to be saying, hell no, I don't want that because I've got the financial institutions at the palm of my hand. That's right. If you're good enough to counterfeit an NFT, you probably own Bank of America, and Bank of America doesn't even know it yet. So why do you care about NFTs? And that is sort of where the value is. They're extremely hard to counterfeit, but they're public. So this art piece of artwork that people painted or people created and sold for $69 million, I can view it the same way that the owner can view it. Now the owner can transfer that art to someone else, and then someone else does have control of it. But at the same time, we can both view it on our computer screens. And if I pay $1,000 for my screen and they pay 1000 for theirs, we're literally viewing the same image. The Mona Lisa, at least you know what I'm viewing on my computer, what I'm viewing on my wall. It's not the real Mona Lisa because unless you rob the Louvre, you're not looking at the real thing. You're not looking upon something that the greatest painter in history looked upon. You're not looking upon a piece of art that has looked, be, been looked upon by kings and nobles around the world. You're not looking upon something that has been touched by greatness so many times we don't even have records of it. But an NFT, yeah, it's been signed by someone, but how unique is that? How unique is a bit? Well, a bit's unique, but at the same time, they can be transferred and they are fungible. If I have a piece of data in one Amazon S3 server and transfer it to another, it's the same piece of data, right? Or is it? Well, that's the questions that we're dealing with with NFTs. And it really is up to the eye of the beholder and the person to figure out, right? Is there something behind the fact that this has been signed by a famous artist? Is Beeple's mouse worth more money because he touched it and used it to sign an NFT? I don't know. And maybe that mouse is now worth $69 million because that's something physical. Again, we don't know, but the interesting thing behind NFTs is the possibilities are endless. Now, right now, they're being used to verify art and guarantee that someone has ownership over something that's been signed, but you could also use them to guarantee ownership in general. If you want to know who royalties belong to, you might be able to use NFTs in the future. For instance, let's take the greatest artist of our time, Machine Gun Kelly. Um, I, I like him, actually. Uh, let's take Machine Gun Kelly, right? He writes a great song. He loves that song. And he knows that every goddamn motherfucker in the world is going to try and steal that song. How does he guarantee that no one can say they created it first? Well, typically, you just drop it before anyone else can. But let's say some dude named Machine Gun Ned. He comes and he drops it first because he robbed Machine Gun Kelly. Well, now all of a sudden, it looks like Ned owns this instead of Kelly. But here's the thing. Let's say you've got an NFT. Let's say that that token was signed and that token can be linked to this song. Well, Ned goes ahead and drops the song and then Machine Gun Kelly comes out and says, well, here's an NFT. It was signed by me two weeks ago and Ned's NFT was signed a day ago. Mine was first, so I rightfully own the song. And then YouTube and everybody on the radio and everybody just generally agrees. And when you want to sell the song and sell the rights to that song, you just transfer the NFT. It's signed by the ledger and it's verified by the world. It's going to be a lot harder to argue that in court because now you can't say, well, there's this document that was counterfeited and I was drunk when I signed this and blah, blah, blah. No, it's just he has it, so it's his, right? If I go and spend $10 at a, I don't know, pizza place when I'm drunk, I can't go back the next day and say, hey, I was drunk, so give it back to me. We might be able to go to court, but they're probably going to throw it out. And I think the same could be said for NFTs and things like that. When they're transferred, they're transferred, and it's a hard transfer. But is it recognized legally? We don't really know how that's going to be held up, and there's probably going to need to be contracts around that. And how much is something worth when you've already got the contract? It could be used to sort things out faster if everybody can agree to use NFTs, but who knows? And everybody's got to get on board with that. So that is a amazing use case, but it's a use case that's far in the future. A use case that's a little bit closer might be for something like tickets. Now, let's say Machine Gun Kelly wants to sell tickets to his show or tickets to his downfall, if you will. He decides to sell 30,000 of those tickets and he uses an NFT to sell them. 
Those 30,000 tickets are owned by 30,000 people. If someone goes and duplicates that ticket, you can check who signed that ticket. You can look at Machine Gun Kelly's website or something like that, or you know he who he is on the blockchain, and you can see that he actually signed those 30,000 NFTs, and these counterfeit NFTs weren't signed by him. So you can go and say, no, this is counterfeit, and this is real, and any old person can do this. Whether a person has the knowledge or the skills necessary to do it, that remains to be seen. Maybe someone's going to create an app or or something like that, but then you've got to trust the app, and now the barrier to entry and the trust has been given back to a company. And the idea behind an NFT is you're taking it away, right? That NFT is owned by one person who signed it with their own key, who created it with their own being, and it can be verified. And the fact that you own it, you can verify that it was actually owned, you can verify its history, you can see who owned it, and you can see the the legitimate story behind it. There's no tall tales because the NFT is the NFT. The blockchain is universal and is held by everybody. So it's impossible to fake or extremely hard to fake. So that's the idea behind an NFT. It is a thing that can be verified to be owned or have to been signed by someone. And it can be used for a huge amount in, amount of use cases. The use case that I think is gonna be the most valuable is when you can associate an NFT with an actual thing. For instance, let's take the $69 million piece of art by Beeple. Well, he sold the virtual copy, but what if the virtual copy came with the physical copy and there was a link between them and I can say, I own the virtual copy and here's a physical copy. If I have the rights to send this virtual copy to you, you know that the physical copy is legitimate. This still does open up to counterfeiting because it's easy or fairly easy for someone to, you know, fake it if they own the NFT. But again, it's going to cut down on that. And there's still a lot to be figured out and there's still a lot more to the story and you've got to trust that people are legitimate because there's always a case where I could own the NFT, the physical item, and I give you a fake of that physical item. I keep one for myself. I give you the NFT and now everything's just murky again. But there's a lot of potential here and there's a lot of really interesting use cases. It's going to be interesting to see where this goes in the future because for all we know, these things could be useless or they could be worth millions and millions of dollars, maybe even $69 million in the case of one specific piece of artwork that's taken the world by storm. Thank you so much for watching. Like I said in the beginning, the video you've been watching here is from Decentraland. It's a game that you can use to display your NFTs. So if you're interested, check it out. If you want to drop any NFTs or any just vacant, unused, bullshit currencies on me my wallet's down below in the description i don't expect anything of actual value but i'm interested in what people are going to send me thank you so much for watching and until next time peace